Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome to the Rowan County first meeting of the month, February the 3rd, 2020. And uh, as is our practice, we will start the day with a prayer and then a pledge. We uh, would welcome you to join us. This prayer is a solemnizing prayer. And um, we always start the meeting with it, which it is intended for the commissioners and will be delivered by our chaplain, the Right Reverend Michael Taylor, Sr. And the invocation will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Join us, please. Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity today, Lord, to represent the County Commissioners, Lord, I ask you today on behalf of them to give them the wisdom they need, Lord. You said in your word, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which give liberally, and upbraideth not. So please give them the wisdom they need today. Thank you for the preparation they've made for this meeting today. Be with them and help them. For those not in attendance today, be with them and help them, Lord. Guide us and lead us now in this meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I should have made an announcement earlier, I guess, but our uh, esteemed pres uh, uh, chairman is at home with a flu bug, and we ask that he not share that with us today. And uh, so he is at home taking liquids and hopefully keeping them down. <laughs> Hoping you hadn't been around him Later. No, yeah. <laughs> so uh, at this time, commissioners, we will uh, consider the additions to the uh, to the agenda. Nobody has any. Is there uh, any deletions to the agenda? Then we will consider approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Do we need approval of the minutes? That was the next thing. Okay. At this point in time, we will, I had it marked on the other one, I used it. Um, yes. We will consider approval of minutes from January the 6th, January the 10th, was our, which was our retreat, and the January 21st, 2020 meetings. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have any public comment? No, you do got to, what I did. I didn't adopt the uh, consent agenda. Did that? No. Okay, at this point in time, we will consider adoption of the consent agenda. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Now we'll do public comment. We don't have anybody signed up. Nobody signed up. And we'll move right into public hearing for STA 02-19 subdivision street standards. Shane, welcome. Thank you, sir. The board will recall back here uh, two months ago when we had a public hearing on the subdivision ordinance street standards to incorporate Appendix D of the fire code into the subdivision ordinance. And at that time, it was tabled for some additional information and just to, to uh, ponder on that for a, a bit. And <clears throat> this is being brought before the board as a continuation hearing. It's also been re-advertised for some um, to address one particular item that was not included in the first submittal. So let's move right into the the language here. On page one and two, this is very minor in nature. I don't think there was any discussion previously. It addresses a couple of definitions at the top and in the bottom part it was largely leftover language that. Uh, should have been clarified previously, but um, was addressed herein, and we caught it when we looked at it. But primarily on page four of the staff report and what you see on the screen here before you, the primary changes that have occurred 
Part of this resulted from some meetings with staff and also in, uh, emergency services folks in early January. And then, of course, the board heard some of that from the 10th at the planning session. But the <clears throat> subsection four here, this is the, the meat of the standards in terms of pavement width and turnaround standards. Any new road built in the county in a subdivision, the width minimum is 20 feet in pavement. That's in number one. Number two, didn't talk about it a whole lot, more in terms of the street width at 26, but there's also previously talked about a clearance reference here adjacent to a hydrant. So in this illustration here, the road's 20 feet wide, and if you come up to a point where there's a hydrant adjacent to the road, there would be a requirement here per section two of this uh, 40 foot plus the beginning and ending taper that would be 26 feet in width for clearance at that hydrant. Most of the time, as you know, in the county, we don't have many fire hydrants, so you're gonna, this is gonna be a dry hydrant most likely. Should that development have public water, then this may occur at multiple intervals along the road unless the developer elects to build the whole road at 26, which is not a requirement here, just the clearance at that hydrant. Point three here would reference all cul-de-sacs have to be 90 feet in diameter. Appendix D was 96. After discussion with emergency staff, it was agreed that 90 feet would, would be acceptable. And this would be for all roads, no matter how short or long. You know, pr prior to, we had the uh, matrix there that changed based on the length of road. And then at the bottom, language that included to reference any additional right-of-way may be necessary for plat recordation that would exceed the DOT minimum. On page five and six, this is something that was not talked about at length during the subcommittee meetings or the planning board, but uh, during that discussion in early last month, the secondary access requirement that was part of Appendix D was talked about and agreed that we would like the commissioners uh, to consider it. If you have more than 30 new lots in a development, a secondary access would be required this doesn't mean it's a second paved road that would be public. It could be a 20 foot wide gravel road with sufficient base to support a fire truck, but would provide another way into that development should uh, the main entrance be blocked or some restriction. There's a clause at the bottom here that provides the commissioners the opportunity for a waiver provision to be considered. You never know what to anticipate if a project doesn't have a lot of road frontage or has some environmental constraints so it would allow the board in those instances to waive that standard if they felt um, relevant and the latter part here instead of just having the expected load the expected load is 75,000 pounds and that's referencing to the uh, appendix d the other thing too I thought would be helpful on that secondary access point, two sources, one I've already alluded to, the, the top is Appendix D that references the 30 foot or 30 or more units and it's only if there's sprinkler system not applied to a home which we know that's not going to occur. And the second point that would be sourcing the west and east plans, there is a recommendation that's been adopted that if a development had 100 or more lots, a secondary point of access would be recommended. Again, that's not a requirement. It was in the plan, but I think it was, is relevant in these discussions um, as a, a point of reference for why that's being included. Again, this was an advertised hearing, so we would need to open up for any comment, but since this is a subdivision text, we don't need statements, just a simple motion to approve in our table. Any questions of the board? Shane, uh, would you be specific now about who, who this applies to and what happens when, uh, when municipalities may have a separate requirement that is broader uh, than ours? Yes, sir. This will only apply for what we classify as a major subdivision. If you're building a new public road, 
which as, as the board probably knows, most of your roads that are built out in the county are either gonna be private or um, public in terms of the maintenance associated in the future. They're built by the developer and at some point, the state will assume maintenance. So in those instances, those are where the roads would uh, apply, but not in the ETJ, not in the city limits. If they are annexed, of course, that's up between the town and the um, property owner. My question is, is and maybe um, Chris or Deborah could answer this. Do you see in the future um, our fire engines getting bigger? I mean, we they're pretty long now, but I'm concerned about, you know, if we adopt this policy now, in 10 years, are we gonna need to adopt another policy, make it an even bigger area? Yes, ma'am, they can be longer. We don't see them getting too much wider because of the road conditions and the road standards. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Swiss, go ahead and uh, open the public hearing at this point in time, and then we'll we'll answer our own questions if we have any more questions after the after the public hearing. If that's okay. So at this time, I'd like to open the public hearing for STA 02-19. Anybody that uh, would like to um, uh, come forward and ask questions, we're open. This is the this is your part. No restrictions on your time. You can come and ask whatever you want. See nobody charging the microphone. I will close the hearings. Excuse me. Be on the way. No. No, you can close. All right. At this point, then having no activity with this we're going to close the hearing and commissioners now if you have any additional questions while we have mr chairman i make a motion to approve sta 20219 second all in favor of the approval aye, aye. any of against uh, vice chairman as a point of uh, procedure because we're not full five members today we'll put this back on for a second reading at the next on the consent, on the consent agenda at the next <clears throat> available yeah. meeting all right at the next meeting. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we have gotten through with that, and now we're going to have a public hearing to consider a no wake zone for Emerald Bay Homeowners Association. Let's see. Shane, you're not involved in that, are you? All right. What has happened is uh, the Emerald Bay uh, Homeowners Association has uh, requested that we create a no wake zone uh, going up to their property at High Rock Lake. And uh, at this time, we will open a public hearing, and anybody that is interested can come forward and make their wishes known. And at this point, we'll open. Yes, sir. Come forward. Give us your name and address and make your Afternoon. presentation. My name is David Porter. I live at 645 Panther Point Trail. Uh, it's right across from uh, Emerald. Um, I, I don't know what the issue is. or I, I, You know, if they're wanting if to put a wake zone there, what, what the benefit of it is. Uh, some of us live on the lake because we like looking at boats coming up and down. That's kind of part of the lake life. Um, at that area that they're talking about, from what I understand, it does get narrow, um, and I can't speak for everyone on my side of the lake, but uh, after talking to Mr. Jim Basinger and Dennis Troutman, uh, we all agreed just kind of leave things the way they are. I mean, there's things that's irritating. I wish I could ban uh, jet skis coming up and down the river, but I can't. Um, I wish I could uh, ban people listening to Luke Bryan on Sunday afternoons when I'm trying to read a book, but I can't. So I don't really see uh, what the benefit is by putting a wake zone up there. Who's going to enforce it? That's more time. You have to bring game, fish, and wildlife in there 
to uh, you know, actually patrol that, make sure no one's creating a wake. Really what defines a wake? Is it damaging people's docks? I've had no issues with it. Um, there are some watercraft, one in particular, it's game fish and wildlife boat, probably makes one of the biggest wakes in the lake. Uh, the other is, you know, sometimes people do come down with the wake boats and they do create wakes and it does, you know, obviously cause a little bit of turbulence with the uh, uh, people's property as far as their docks. But just speaking for myself and a couple neighbors who are not here, it's like I said, I'm kind of opposed to uh, actually having a wake zone. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, he's willing to answer it. Mr. Porter, would you? Mr. Porter, would you would wait? You she has a question, question for it. Uh, before you get started, let me just explain to uh, anybody else that is here and interested. Uh, the Wildlife Association has come back to us, and if uh, do we have a slide with this? That okay. There are three different options on here. One of them is. One of them, the no wake zone will start at Emerald Bay property. Option two, it will start further down uh, the cove. And then three is out almost to where uh, the, uh, where the uh, cove enters the, the High Rock Lake right there. And, and those are three of the things that we could consider tonight uh, with the uh, wildlife's uh, submission to us. Okay, go ahead, Judy. I'm sorry. So, do you live on the same side of the lake as some of the folks that have come before and want the wake, no wake zone? No, ma'am. I actually live directly across from there. If you okay. a straight line across, so I'd estimate maybe. 300 yards is how, how wide it is between that gap. If I remember correctly, um, one of the big issues was the wakes coming up and eroding the shore. Um, so does that happen on your side of the lake? Well, yes, ma'am, to some extent. Uh, you know, we do have the rocks stacked up there to assist with that. I've been there 10 years. I'm not aware of any, I've not lost maybe inches of property, I don't know, but it, it's not been noticeable. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Come forward, please. Give us your name and address, if you would, please. My name is Mark Scott, 414 Emerald Bay Drive. As you may recall, I was here a month or so ago um, and uh, made the proposal. I'm the president of the Emerald Bay Homeowner Association. Um, I wanted to um, uh, respond a bit that the reason why we were uh, asking for a no-wake zone uh, didn't have to do with property damage, although there is property damage to docks and, um, and, the, uh, and the shoreline, uh, particularly uh, since the uh, riprap uh, was no longer permitted um, to, uh, to be installed along. That may, be, that may have changed recently, but uh, for the last number of years it uh, was not permitted. But the reason we had asked for this was strictly from a safety standpoint. Uh, jet skis uh, and particularly um, boats pulling skiers and um, children on tubes down uh, Panther Creek uh, make their turns frequently uh, in front of our community uh, dock, and um, which is in the hash, which is uh, roughly where the hash lines are, and the and the lower um, uh, balloon uh, statement there, and come very close to uh, the uh, the docks on our side, and actually the the piers on the other side uh, as well, and uh, and so from a safety standpoint, we are very concerned about uh, eventually uh, someone on a tube, someone on a water ski, uh, someone on a uh, jet ski, although that's less likely, is going to hit one of the docks there. Um, and so that's our concern. 
And that's, uh, and particularly down around our uh, community peers, which is why uh, the uh, recommendation that we made was to have the no wake zone begin uh, roughly 50 yards uh, upstream from, uh, from us. Now, um, uh, as far as a, what constitutes a wake, I believe the Wildlife Commission has a definition of uh, speed of watercraft that then defines uh, whether the wake is, um, meets their definition of being a no wake, oops, pardon me, uh, of being a no wake or not. Um, I believe the other two bullet uh, balloons on the uh, map there were other proposed locations that uh, wildlife had proposed after they had taken a look at this. At least that's my uh, understanding uh, of it. Any questions? Vice Chairman, if I may. Uh, we talked about this at the last meeting, and, and we do need to ident identify you guys as the financially responsible party. You guys are going to have to purchase the buoy. Mm -hmm. Wildlife Resource Commission maintains it now, right? Um, so you don't have to post anything for that. But and, uh, and my understanding of the cost of, given my current understanding of the cost of the buoy, um, our association has agreed to do that. Okay. We'll, we'll talk to you about that. If they approve the resolution, we'll talk about that before the application. Okay. What happens today is we, we will just, uh, if this passes, we will, we will sign a resolution uh, about one of these three markers here, or one of these areas that the, that the uh, commissioners choose right here, and then it will go back to the Wildlife Association, and they will start their investigation and and they will make the final decision about this. This is just a recommendation from the commissioners that we, we, we don't control that. The Wildlife Association <clears throat> will get our recommendation, but they can do what they want to. Anything else for me, sir? Not for me. I'm good. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Ladies and gentlemen, good to see everybody. It's Stephen Kidd, and I reside at the second balloon from the bottom <laughs> at 710 Emerald Bay Drive. Uh, have resided there since 2004. Have um, years of experience of boating and jet skiing uh, up and down that particular uh, point uh, for many, many, many years. And the experience that I have personally seen over those years, uh, Emerald Bay has continued to grow and expand homes and with that comes more piers that are allowed to jetty out away from the shoreline as far as 75 feet same thing is the case on the other side so there's 150 feet that are taken up by piers which is tightening up the space to actually maneuver your boat or your jet skis and when you have oncoming traffic coming from both directions it gets even tighter and when you're dealing with pulling skiers especially children uh, on tubes. Uh, for those of you who are not boat avious, you basically when you're pulling a tube, you swing them left and right. You don't just simply pull them and go straight. You're swinging them so that they hit the waves that you're creating, so that they get a fun ride out of it. Well, when you get that oncoming traffic, that becomes an even bigger issue. Um, you have three different options on here to consider for uh, a no-wake zone. Uh, my home, again, like I said, is there at the second balloon. And you can see there's a wide opening there where if we choose the bottom balloon for the no wake zone, what will happen is all oncoming traffic coming up to that area will then choose our opening as their turn spot. And what we have also uh, experienced here of late are very large wake boats that will pull not only one tube, but in some cases three tubes with children loaded on top of them, beating and banging on top of each other, and then they go flying off. And uh, at several times, we've witnessed them come pretty darn close to hitting piers, uh, which would be tragic. 
Uh, we also uh, personally experienced uh, damage to our pier. We actually lost our pier. It came off of our, um, our stationary pier, the floater and the gangway actually dislocated from it uh, while we were on vacation. We got a phone call saying, hey, your boat and your floater are getting ready to head down to the dam. Uh, so, and, that's, and that's been due to uh, kind of a fad, I think, of lately. These, these, these uh, wake boats load water inside of their, 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 their belly, their hole, which causes the boat to dip even lower, which creates an even larger wake for the purposes of the skier behind them to have a larger jump. But when those boats come through, they're just creating even more, more waves, which does cause some problems. Any questions? So, Stephen, when um, you, you were talking about the 75-foot piers coming out on both sides, how much space does that actually leave for the boats and jet skiers to come by or through? Well, like Mr. Porter said, he, he had estimated that there was about uh, 300 um, yards between his home and the, the home right across from him, uh, which would be Mark Scott and, and um, a few others. Uh, so there are some wide points, but then as you look, there's also some very narrow points uh, throughout that particular uh, creek. Uh, so there could be, you know, like I said, there are, there are spots where it does become very dangerous for two boats to be on coming at each other, especially if they're pulling skiers, and you throw in some jet skis along with it, it becomes like I-85 at certain times, especially during the, the heat of summer. Now, you said that you've lived out on the water for a long time. Um, when did these, and I didn't catch the name of the type of boat. Wake boat. Wave boat. Mm -hmm. When did they start it, um, coming on the scene? They've been around for, for quite a while, to my knowledge. Um, it's just become more popular, I think, really in the past 10 years. And again, a lot of the development in our neighborhood has really occurred since 2010, since the economy's gotten better. We've had a lot more properties sell, more homes being built, and of course, more piers being built. Just tightening up that whole space. So really what it all boils down to is property damage on the docks. That is one of them. The primary reason that the association is asking for this is for safety reasons. So you, I mentioned the children being flown off of the tubes mm -hmm. and, and coming close to hitting. You know, we have a metal pier. If a child was to come around and be slingshotted around and they were to actually hit our pier, it, it, it could severely injure them. Uh, so, Mr. Insurance person, Mr. Vice Chair, does that mean that the property owner would be liable if the kid gets slingshot up onto his dock? It depends on what 12 people on a jury say, but typically the, the owner of the boat is responsible for injuries that, would, that are caused uh, by the... Or the the, the injuries that a skier would receive, uh, the, the boat owner is responsible. Now, whether they hit a, a log in the river or they hit a piece of pier that has come detached, there's, that's why you have so many attorneys. You have different ideas on these things. But typically, it's the, uh, uh, it's the boat owner's responsibility to pull people in safety. Yeah. And as long as pier, now, you know, we're assuming that all piers are exact, built exactly the way that uh, um, whoever was, whoever owns it now, I don't know, it's, it's cubed hydro, Cube hydro and sold yeah. it to now, but a Canadian, a company, Canadian I think. firm now yeah. owns it. So, um, you know, we're assuming that all these things, when I tell you this, were built up to standards. So, um, but sometimes defending yourself is as expensive as paying a litigation some also so so finally my, my primary appeal to this is if we're going to consider a no wake zone uh, at the bottom bubble you're just increasing the amount of traffic that will be turning in front of our bubble uh, which will increase the risk of, uh, of injury there in, in my opinion and it's just an opinion if you place a no wake zone where you see um, the second one from the bottom boaters will more than likely not come in as fast or use it as a skiing area because they won't have a place to turn. That makes sense. It's not as much fun to take skiers up and down that creek if you don't have a place to turn and continue the skiing process. If you have to stop the boat, let them drop, 
come back around, pick them back up, and then go in the other direction, they're likely going to choose another area to go skiing. Mr. Kidd, let me address that for you. Um, <clears throat> our recommendation, if we put it forward, uh, will be for one of the three areas, but it will be wet, left up to the wildlife to decide which one they choose. Yep. So regardless of which one, that we, if we would pass this, uh, we aren't the decision makers here today. We're simply moving this along, let wildlife make the decision on what they think's best. Very good. So you all are not making a recommendation as to whether you're doing, using one, two, or three? Yes, we will. Keep. We will make a re We will make a recommendation, but our recommendation is not necessarily the one they'll choose. So my appeal is just for your all's recommendation as to which one I would recommend. Right. Yeah. Steve. Yes. Not being a boater, how often... So when people are out there and they see these no-wake zones, how often do they actually, do they pay attention to that or are people still zoom through these wake zones? Sure. So, um, yeah, I travel all over the lake and anytime you see a no-wake zone, I'm always assuming that the wildlife is just around the corner uh, watching. So typically going underneath bridges, you'll find no-wake zones. That's the most normal spot that you'll see them. Uh, but there are certain coves that you are not allowed to create a wake, and it's typically because there's a lot of uh, boat storage or it's a tight area or it's shallow for whatever reason. It's for your own safety, they, they put those out there. So, no, I, honestly, I, I adhere to everyone that I see. Uh, you might see the occasional person who doesn't adhere to it, and they do that at their own risk, I think, of getting a ticket. So do, <clears throat> typically with the people doing the um, tubing or, would they be? Would they live in this cove, or they come there from somewhere else? And, and um, I would say that probably um, it's probably fifty-fifty. You have a lot of homes that live on Panther Creek on both sides, uh, so I can't really say that this is the exact number of people who you know come down our creek. But I, I do know that we do get visitors from other parts of the lake that do like to use that particular creek uh, for skiing and for tubing. So is that not um, like I said? Like I'm not a Boater, so it, is there not a main channel that people do that in or is that just too big? oh there's plenty of space for everybody to go <laughs> yeah if you look over at the top the top bubble is your entryway into the main river and uh, to the left is the other side of emerald bay which um, is a nature preserve lots of water over there that skiing can be done tubing and, and a lot of tubing does happen out in the main river uh, tubing doesn't have to have ha does not have to have glassy water in fact it's more fun if it's not glassy you want it bouncy for the kids right Skiing, you do want glassy water. You don't want, you typically do not see skiing out there on the main river. You do see sometimes, but they're a pretty skilled skier to do that. Uh, a lot of skiers will choose calmer waters uh, to do that type of activity. All right, if there's no more questions, uh, would the other young lady and gentleman like to come up now, give us your opinion? Um, we have our Carol Eisenberg and Timothy Eisenberg. Um, you want me to start? Yeah. Right. <laughs> we also live in that second bubble. It is our um, summer cottage, more or less, maybe eight months out of the year. But we have the very same issues as the previous gentleman described. I would have to add one, though, and that is that um, these... <laughs> Um, heavy displace, displacement haul boats come down the creek and they reach our bubble and then quite often and we sit here and watch this every summer they circle and circle and circle and circle at a fast speed because they can circle there because there's two coves opens up and they can just circle and it's extremely dangerous. Um, if there's a ski boat with children, it makes it even more dangerous, and because that's one of our main concerns. The only other point I'd like to make, or we would like to make, or and, and Tim may like to make another one, is that um, this is at full pond. When the water drops, it's even worse. And very often, we don't have full pond in the summer. So um, to us, it's a dangerous situation, 
for boaters. If you're in a canoe, a kayak, or a um, sailboat, you better watch out because it's going to, somebody coming at a fast speed is not going to see you. And um, we've watched that too. And um, better that it be taken care of before somebody gets hurt. But our concern is the second bubble needs to be part of the no wake zone. The first bubble would probably work for us. And, and anybody that doesn't really like this, all they have to do is, what, eighth of a mile up, and they can go full speed if you don't want another one. So not really keeping anybody from having fun, but just stop turning around right there. There's a whole lot more traffic now than it was 30 years ago, a lot. And people don't know the rules of the road. Uh, you took away the stoplight and didn't give people <laughs> a driver's test. You can imagine what would happen. That's what we know is going to happen there. We've seen it. People uh, just barely miss piers on ski boats. Kids fall off. The water's so choppy you can't see their little heads in the water. And I just don't want to really go down there and think about some kid getting chopped up or whatever. Just it's not a real happy thing. So that's all I got to say. Um, we have our son who lives in Arizona, and he um, is not a resident of Burlington County anymore, but he was for 30, yeah. 30 years, but he was home for the summer, and he um, <clears throat> noticed this as he was fishing and so forth and so on. So um, he tried to contact the Wildlife Commission. Well, he did contact Best Betsy Haywood. and. Um, she directed him to tell us that we needed to pursue this and think, and of course today you're having this meeting, not, not due to us, but because the issue has come up. So it is an issue. And um, there are a lot of homes on that creek. And not only are there a lot of homes, but a lot of the old cottages are being fixed up and made into full-time homes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question <clears throat> before you go, folks. Sorry. That's okay. Um, you mentioned that there's a lot more boats. Does anybody track the number of uh, boats, like per year or per decade, the average number? Okay. No, but if you, if you live down there, uh, the actual number, we don't know, but you would know on the weekends it's uh, hazardous. I like to sail myself. And sailboats not under under sail have the right of way. Ninety percent of the people with boats don't know that, <laughs> and it's been scary. Uh, uh, okay. So you you get a bigger sailboat and you put a motor on it, you motor out, and then you yeah. then you have fun and part of the lake. Yeah. But it's it's sort of scary working your way out. And if you have a kayak, unless you got your paddles have some reflectors on them or something, people can't see it. And of course canoes and stuff. And swimmers, all you see is the head. So, but we've seen a lot of, like the gentleman said about the uh, kids in the tubes. Mm -hmm. They fall off all the time. And if you got two or three pontoon boats with all of them with three or four tubes behind them and they're doing this, they're, somebody's gonna get killed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty given. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, just a point of information, uh, Mr. Attorney, this, matrix that we received here, did we decide that this was filled out by the association or by the wildlife? Yeah, I think that was the association representative that helped fill that out and okay. submit it. And, uh, and, and what will happen is when we submit the information, when we submit it, uh, they'll, they'll review it. They've already done some review. And uh, I think they'll post the rule for comment online for some period of time. Uh, 60 days um, and then they'll actually have a meeting where you're allowed to attend in person um, and, vo and make any comment before they adopt the rule and so that's where we're talking about just getting the process going with making a basic recommendation that's where people can come in and ask for it to be extended and, and you can do that with, with them there so that, that's what we anticipate just as a point of information that form said that the uh, channel itself ranged from 290 feet to 400 feet. 
and that the water depth in there, and it, it's got it by zones in here. It says zone uh, is 18 to 15 feet deep. And at the back of the uh, the creek at the hazard buoy is approximately five feet average in the channel. So we were trying to get some concept of the size of, of this thing, and I can't I can't swear to the accuracy of this. It's just what what we have received in here that is in your your information. Is there any anybody else that has uh, anything they'd like to say about this issue? I complain. I just wanted to, to clarify on your uh, depth at the buoy. When the lake's all the way up at its highest point, it's right at seven foot. I fish it all the time. The distance from my dock all the way down to the end is exactly 1,000 meters. Guy at the end, he uses a, uh, a skull. He goes back and forth, so he gave me that distance. And I'd have to agree with uh, Mr. Kidd. If you're going to actually put a uh, no wake zone, it would be much better to do it probably up at the front of the lake because of the distance. Like I said, it's only a thousand meters. Once you get on the back side of that um, buoy that's out in the center, it's across from me, uh, the lake turns to the right. Uh, it stays about a three to four foot when the lake's all the way up, uh, all the way, and it has a very tight sandbar. Um, so to Mr. Kidd's point and probably to the others, because uh, I wouldn't when my neighbors come and ask me to come up here and talk today, I really wasn't prepared. I said, sure, I'll go up and tell them that you guys don't want this because I didn't want it either. I just wanted people to still come down. But I wasn't looking at the safety factor. And so uh, Mr. Kidd spot on with that as well as the uh, uh, other couples. We moved there in 2010. Uh, the boat traffic, I will say, from probably uh, Memorial Day through the whole summer is at least doubled and the actual amount of boats i have no idea but on memorial day on the holidays uh it's pretty much bumper to bumper a kind of line going all the way down and turning around and um i bass fish a lot so uh to the other gentleman's point with a kayak sometimes when i'm cruising around and people come out with a kayak you really don't see them that well in the water so but i just want you to know the distance is about a thousand is exactly a thousand meters to the mouth and then uh, right there at the buoy, seven foot at its highest point when the water's up. Thank you. Sir, sir, sir. Ms. Porter. You're saying option, excuse me, if we were gonna do it, option one or option two would be better. I'm sorry, I said again? Uh, are you saying option one or option two would be better if we were going to? For the, uh, where the no wake would be? I, I would say at the very far end where it turns. Um, if you look at the first bubble that uh, Mr. Kidd was talking about, he's, he's kind of between, I think, closer to the second one. Um, the lake's actually relatively wide there, um, but the water's also um, right, right where that little island is off to the left. It's very shallow, so boats don't really get over there. Some of the pontoon boats go over there, but uh, when the summer, when the lake's probably average, it's only about five feet of water. So for skiing and stuff, I wouldn't... I wouldn't pull anybody over there uh, skiing. Um, so for me personally, if you're gonna put a wake zone in, I'd put it up at the furthest end, because like I said, it's only approximately a thousand meters, so six tenths of a mile to the very back uh, versus, because Mr. Kidd brings out a good point. If you put it further down, it's just you got people turning around sooner. Um, I don't think it solves your problem. It just pushes it a little bit further up. Uh, the main channel, once they're out there, and it is choppy in the summer when a lot of people are out in the main channel, um, but the main channel is almost, uh, it's about a little over a mile across. So it's very wide uh, right there. And it, going all the way down to the dam, um, you know, they, it goes out and then going to the dam. I mean, there's several square miles of um, quality, you know, water as far as depth, and it's wide open for boats to maneuver. Thank you. Anybody else? We've got all night. I just, my name's Steve Six and I live at 345 Panther Point Trail. And I just moved in last June. And I bought one of the cottages and renovated it making it my retirement home. And my wife and I were just amazed at 
the safety factor of the boats coming down because numerous times we've watched pontoons which can't turn quickly running side by side pulling four tubes each and turning at the second bubble. They turn right in front of our house and we watch them. Lo and behold, here comes two jet skis. Kids fall off. I did, it's a safety issue more than it is trying to tread on anybody's use of the water. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you giving us your opinion. Anybody else? Don, you live on the river or going to? You got an opinion? Okay. <laughs> All right, at this point, if there's nobody else that would like to join us tonight, we'll close this and uh, see any motions. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to make a motion to read this resolution. Uh, and then after that motion, I'd like to have a vote, please. <clears throat> resolution to establish a no-wake zone in the vicinity of Panther Creek slash Emerald Bay community piers. Whereas, under the authority of North Carolina General Statute Section 75A-15, any subdivision of the state of North Carolina may at any time, after public notice, make formal application to the Wildlife Resource Commission for special rules and regulations in reference to be safe and reasonable operation of vessels on the water within territorial limits. Whereas, Rowan County has given public notice of its intent to make formal application to the Wildlife Resource Commission for special rules and regulations in reference to the safe and reasonable operation of vessels on High Rock Lake within the territorial limits of Rowan County and for the implementation of a uniform, uniform waterway marker system in all waters of the county. Now, therefore, be it resolved in accordance to North Carolina General Statute 75A-15, the Board of Rowan County Commissioners requests that the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission uh, to promulgate special rules and regulations with reference to the safe and reasonable operation of vessels in High Rock Lake, which is located in Rowan County. The pertinent substance of the proposed regulations is as follows. No wake zone in the waters of High Rock Lake from Panther Creek shore to shore west of, west of a line that is 50 yards east of the community piers in Emerald Bay, which is 35.60186 north and 80.2. 5738 West for a distance deemed appropriate by the Wildlife Commission. That would be option number two. Be it therefore resolved that the Rowan County Board of Commissioners request that the commissions promulgate regulations fully implementing the, uni the uniform waterway marking system to all waters of, of the county. This is the third day of February 2020. I'll make that in the form of a motion. Second. All right, and for those of us that went to Westerland High School, that's the furthest one out, if you <laughs> didn't read that. So that's what we're voting on at this point in time. And all in favor of going to this, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And, and Vice Chair, if we could have a motion to authorize staff to submit the necessary applications and supporting documents, that'd be that was uh, that was the next thing that we're going to get into here. If you'd authorize them to do that, and you have already identified a responsible party in this, so uh, do we need to get approval of everybody then to so make that formal motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed. Check. Good deal. Did it. That's the reason I said that. Okay. Um, all of I know y'all are very interested in the rest of what's going on here tonight, but uh, you folks that came to uh, uh, give us your opinion are free to go at this point in time. There's no fee for you going out the door at this point. At this time, we'll have the uh, update regarding the Cardinal Innovations Health Care. Yeah, 
Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Melissa Bunker, and I am the regional executive for Cardinal Innovations in our southern region. And I am pleased to be here with Ms. Alyssa, and we're going to give you a bit of an update on some things that are happening in the county with regard to health care. So just a quick overview of what we want to talk about today. I wanted to give you guys an overview real quickly about what Card who Cardinal Innovations is and what our current governance structure is. wanted to share with you about a partnership that we have begun with Healthy Rowan and their community coalition. And also want to share with you why it's important for you yourselves, the Rowan Board of County Commissioners and the Rowan County Advisory Council um, have a collaboration. We'll talk about what that's about. So real briefly, Cardinal Innovations is a Medicaid insurance company. So we manage the funds, Medicaid funds, and also state funds for individuals who have Medicaid insurance or have no insurance at all. And we do these things in, for very specific services that are behavioral health, substance use disorder, and intellectual developmental disabilities. However, the state of North Carolina is about to enter into what is termed Medicaid transformation. So all of the individuals who receive Medicaid under this future plan will receive joint services. Both their physical and their behavioral health services will happen under said insurance company in the future. So this particular governance model that we've created is in an effort to integrate the community partnerships and the care for what we have across for those individuals who depend on the public system for care. So the biggest key pieces about this governance structure that we want you all to understand is that it is a collaboration on the gaps and needs in Rowan County as well as our southern region counties. The governance model's goal is to drive positive outcomes for the community at the local level. It's also about giving the community the opportunity to actually have power in the funding and the decision making on where the money goes. It's also about partnerships and how the communities that are working to seek grant opportunities could potentially partner with each other and not work in competition. And it is also to provide a roadmap for success, both for Rowan County and for the Southern region. Um, a strategic plan truly does help to provide that roadmap on where you are gonna go and how you're gonna get there. And currently that is not a structure that most of our communities have in place. And so a lot of people are doing a lot of good work, but they're working op opposite of each other. So real quickly, um, this is sort of a detailed structure of what we aim and what we're in the process of creating. And you'll notice um, the southern region is down in your right hand um, corner. The southern region includes Cabarrus County, Mecklenburg County, Rowan, Stanley, and Union counties. And then over to the right side, in the teal color, you'll notice that each of these counties would have their own advisory council that sort of feeds up their communication into this regional health council, where of which there is one. Then underneath that, you see an, a box called an operations council. We'll go through what each of these mean in just a minute. And we'll go back and see what this looks like as well. It's a little bit difficult to follow. So don't, if you, if you're, if you get confused, give yourself a bit of grace. It's not the easiest thing to understand at first glance. So you'll notice I tried to give you a, a picture of what you're looking at on the larger graph. So this particular box is the regional health councils. And the goal with the regional health councils is to have, again, an integrated healthcare membership with the group overseeing the improvement plan, a regional health improvement plan. And that improvement plan is driven in support by the county advisory councils and the operations council. The health council is facilitated in this region by myself, the regional executive. We meet quarterly. It is a seven to 15 member group. It is of course, five counties as we talked about before and we did already have our first meeting 
last week. Your Southern Regional Health Council is made up of these individuals. Each of these individuals were, a, they, they found out about the Regional Health Council structure and the opportunity last year, and they were given the opportunity to actually apply for a position on that Regional Health Council. And there was a whole process that we went through to determine and make sure that the right stakeholders were at the right table, uh, of course, keeping in line with um, cultural diversity um, and the, the, that the stakeholders were a nice um, melding of representation for the region. So you have a CFAC rep, Consumer Family Advisory Council, that's what CFAC stands for. You have the Cardinal representative, as myself. You have a Board of Directors representative, one of our Cardinal Innovations Board of Directors representative. This individual is Beverly Morrow. We have a DSS director. We have a non-CFAC member, an individual who is representing the member, member and family interest, but does not sit on the statutorily required CFAC group. Then we also seek to have additional member and family. We look, we aimed to have a county commissioner. You'll, you'll notice that um, Commissioner Klusman is that commissioner for our region, which we're very happy to have. We also have a sort of a stakeholder that represents um, the interest of maybe your nonprofits or other areas. We have a behavioral health member. We have a physical health member. And then you'll notice that there are chair positions for each of those county advisory councils. And then we have what's called a flex position, um, just to make sure that we always, the goal of course, to always have a quorum. Um, and that flex position is Dr. Nicole French. I put the three plus out to the right hand side to reference that interestingly enough, Rowan County on our regional health council has three plus participants in an, in an odd way. Um, we have um, Donna Faco, we have uh, Judy Klusman. The plus is really Miss Nitu Verma, who used to work in Rowan County um, and was heavily involved in this community. She is now actually on a project in Stanley County and is actually representing Stanley County, but of course has a Rowan history. So that's sort of where you get the three plus. And then of course, Alyssa, will fill the chair position for the county advisory council and we'll get to what that why we came to that conclusion in just a minute so your community county advisory councils are made up of um, again it's four re um, we have four regions across our entire state and then um, so there are 20 individual advisory councils each of these also similar to their rhc have seven to 15 members voting um, this group supports the creation of the Regional Health Improvement Plan, and this membership is an integrated membership, and this is sort of opening up the plan for how we are going to partner with Healthy Rowan and their steering committee. We're going to meet two times a quarter ahead of your Regional Health Council meeting, and this meeting is open to the community. So although there are only 7 to 15 voting members, we do plan to encourage as many community members to participate in the, this um, county advisory council as possible. Yes, ma'am. And Melissa, um, we do have public comment time at each of our meetings, correct? Yes, we can absolutely do that. We do, you, are you saying at the regional health council or at the county advisory council? I think any, any uh, level. Yes. So this slide kind of tells you a little bit about, a little bit more about the purpose of the Com Community Advisory Council, um, the appointments, the meeting cadence, just kind of gives you a little bit more of a, a deeper dive and what that looks like. Interestingly enough, what was great about our partnership um, on trying to roll this out is that this county is ahead of the game. This county has Healthy Rowan Coalition, and it is pretty much exactly what we were aiming to create with our county advisory council so in an effort to not have duplication we have got together we work together and we're partnering on basically turning the current healthy rowan steering committee into the beginnings of our rowan county advisory council so we'll talk more about that in just a minute 
So you may be thinking, well, what's this operations council and where does that fit in? So another brief sort of backstory on why this is important is that your hospitals, your health departments, and Cardinal Innovations are required to do what's called a health needs assessment. The schedules for those are on very different time frames. Cardinal Innovations is required to do an assessment every year on the gaps and needs and the, the lack of ser or where, what services are lacking in those areas. The hospitals and the health departments are on very different schedules and are ranging between two and three years. So all of these entities are creating these health assessments and for the most part, they're all coming back with about the same responses. We need more access to behavioral health care. We don't have enough transportation. Housing is an issue. All of these things are coming back on these assessments on a fairly regular basis. And unfortunately, it's been very tough for anybody to move the needle on fixing these issues because there's not been, no one entity has enough money, quite frankly, to be able to infuse in any community what needs to be infused to fix transportation just as an example. So the goal with this is, again, to create partnership, to draw out the fact that regardless of where the assessments and the surveys are arriving from, that you're pretty much getting the same answers and no one has a structure in place to work together to be able to move the needle and empower the community with some financial <laughs> impact. To make, to make things happen. So this Regional Operations Council, we look to work with our communities to bring all of these entities together and start moving in the same direction. So this is just another view of the structure. Um, in case you wanna look, you should have these in your uh, packets. And I do apologize if these slides are slightly different. I noticed I had made some mistakes in my quick um, putting this together. So we made some changes before I actually presented this morning. Um, so this is another view of the structure. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alyssa and let her tell you a little bit about um, the history of Healthy Rowan and that partnership. And then we'd love to get answer any questions that you have. Mr. Vice Chairman, um, commissioners, staff, thank you so much for your time this afternoon for us to share about this partnership and uh, frankly to just bring about some information around Healthy Rowan and our history. So Healthy Rowan was started actually back in 1999 as part of the Healthy Carolinians project with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so it existed as this sort of meeting where folks would go uh, and present, hey, this is what I'm doing in the community, this is what I'm working on, but there was no real collaboration. And when I speak to collaboration, I mean ways that we work together to enhance capacity, not to necessarily um, take away from any one agency, but to work better together to have a greater return on investment when we look at health issues um, here in the county. And so in 2015, Healthy Rowan was revitalized, uh, which was when I was brought on board. Uh, and really what we started to do is pull all of these different organizations together um, to utilize their unique and collaborative strengths uh, to identify and address health and quality of life issues uh, here in Rowan County. And it's important for me to note that we include representation uh, from leaders, not just from healthcare and from government, although we do and find it very important, but also business and industry, human services, community service agencies, uh, medical service providers, education institutions, the general population and the faith community. Because what we have found and what is being supported right now at the um, Department of Health and Human Services uh, is that an approach has to be cross-sector and multi-sector um, in order to make any sort of improvement. So economic development plays into health, health plays into economic development. Um, same when we look at human service agencies. Um, and similarly, when we look at those issues that have really risen to the top through our community health assessment, um, that was a partnership between um, our hospital system, our healthcare, um, health department, Healthy Rowan, and our Rowan County United Way. So we really have seen that you cannot separate the head from the body and you need to have all of these organizations uh, to the table if we are to make any sort of improvement uh, in health in, here in Rowan County. Healthy Rowan, as it exists today, we are governed by a seven member executive board um, and have more than 25 community partners that meet each month. 
uh, which is pretty amazing when you think we've been doing this for about four years now, and we consistently have uh, really, really great uh, representation from our different sectors uh, and continue to grow uh, in the partners that we have at the table. We're currently supported financially by the Duke Endowment uh, and the Healthy People, Healthy Carolinas initiative, uh, bringing in um, almost a million dollars in grant funding into Rowan County to address chronic disease and obesity. Uh, but what we have seen and what the partners at the table have seen is that we don't need to just focus on the healthy lifestyle behaviors, but also need to involve of these conversations about mental health and substance use, uh, because we are not really able to say we have healthy lifestyle behaviors uh, without discussing these other areas. So Healthy Rowan also functions to advocate for health and all policy, to provide support and implement evidence-based interventions, which means that we look at things that have research-based success before bringing them into our community. So we already know that they're going to work. We just have to move forward with implementation. Um, and then again, facilitating that collaboration between agencies uh, to improve health outcomes, because that's our ultimate goal, is that we have the healthiest citizens that have the best quality of life so that we can continue to attract folks um, and keep folks here uh, to live long and healthy lives. And this is a slide, I'm not going to read it to you, but I, I love this thought process is that Healthy Rowan is not just about networking. It's not just about getting folks in the room to start saying, hey, I'm working on this. Oh, you're working on that. It's not just about the coordination of services, although that's important. It's not just about cooperating, but it's truly about collaborating, where you lift some other organization up, even if it means that you stay value neutral in this process. Uh, and that's very important, I think, to the ethos of Rowan County and to the organizations that we have around the table. This is our current reporting structure for Healthy Rowan. Uh, one of the things that we're very excited about is growing our executive committee and bringing Melissa on board with that and partnering and forming this new community advisory council. For us, it's important to reduce the number of meetings that folks are going to, so we're not having 10 meetings with the same people talking about the same thing and spinning our wheels, not really getting anything done. Um, and instead, we really want to focus and abide by those principles of collective impact, um, that we focus on a common agenda, we have uh, align our resources and efforts, and we use common measures of success, uh, which Melissa has discussed as she talks about that operations council. Um, this, again, is the, the current structure and our partnership with our community care clinic. Um, so Krista Woolley at the community care clinic actually got this started uh, back in 2015 with a small grant. Um, and we're very excited that we're going into our fourth year uh, and we still have all these folks around the table to help improve health here in Rowan County. So the last thing I really want to discuss is that we see this partnership with Cardinal as such a value add to the work that we're already doing. Um, it's imperative that we have the expertise, especially when, it look, when we look at substance use, mental health, and uh, populations who are most in need, and that's what they're bringing to the table. What we're able to do with Healthy Rowan is continue to have a structure and a function of, of coalition meetings that don't need to be you know, have 10 different meetings to talk about the same thing. And I think that's what, again, what's most important is we have a singular area that we can all work together, um, that we're not separating the head from the body and able to have these discussions about physical and mental health uh, in the same meeting. All right. How, you mind my asking you? Yeah. How do you measure, you, you said you've been doing this for four years, how do you measure your effect on the community? So one of the ways that we measure success is we look at our county health rankings. Um, so Rowan County in 2017 was ranked. Who does the ranking? Um, the University of Wisconsin. It's a national ranking that they pull data from uh, various areas, whether that's the NC Center for Health Statistics, um, the behavior risk factor survey that happens in the community uh, from the Department of Public Instruction, um, so various sources that don't have bias in them, and they compile that data, and they do this for every county um, in every state in the United States. And ideally, the assessment that we mentioned that all these organizations are doing on their own, that technically should give you also some good information on how well the community is changing and growing and, and bringing in new opportunities that are health-related. But as I mentioned before, the same 
issues continue to arise on these assessments on a regular basis. And so the hope is that through building this regional health improvement plan, having these assessments come back, that you really will have a better picture in three to five years on truly how much improvement has been made. Yeah, so we are proud to say that we have grown from 76th, so it's ranked 1 to 100, 1 being the best, 100 being the worst. Rowan County was ranked 76th. Um, we are now, in 2019, we were ranked 59th um, in comparison to this. For the state of North Carolina. Yes, sir. Oh, Carolina. The yeah, Carolina. just for North Carolina. Do we have a county um, ranking? Uh, a count, like a state ranking or... Well, the 76 that you said we started out at, I assume, was a state ranking. So that's, yeah, out of the 100 counties in, in North Carolina, yep, and now we're ranked now, 59th. 59th. <clears throat> so our goal, yeah, with Healthy Rowan is to, to get it above the 50th and continue to improve health. The things that we recognize, though, is that it took us a long time to get here, and it's not going to be just a couple of years of changes um, to have that improvement or change in culture of health that we're really all going to have to commit in order to make um, those changes and see the needle move uh, in some of those other areas. So in closing, basically the, the goals for today were to basically let you know about this partnership um, make sure you're aware of your opportunity to have a voice in the Cardinal Innovations um, governance structure and also for, for you to have an opportunity to say, you know, we, we would just love to hear from you your thoughts if you are, um, if you feel like we're on the right track. Maybe there are some individuals that you feel like should be, we should reach out to to make sure that are included in as we move forward. And just wanted to give an opportunity for you to have some feedback and ask, ask some questions. And thank you for the time. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, Alyssa, would you uh, please talk about some of the wins, as I would call them, some of the projects that, that Healthy Rowan has been involved in and what we have been able to achieve locally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking. So one of the things that we really want to focus on is how can we improve um, health in the areas that it's already happening. So one of our big wins is our daily mile program. Um, so you may have heard of this, but we worked with the school system to create a policy change to allow students uh, in every elementary school 15 minutes for physical activity. And what that has done is we've been able to track this over time, and we have students who now have more than 175,000 miles walked um, in this year alone. And so that's activity and physical activity that would not have been done without the, the movement of Healthy Rowan. Um, the other one I really like to mention is our exercises medicine program. And we're not just focused on physical activity, uh, but exercises medicine has been fantastic. Uh, we worked with our free clinic, so the Rowan County um, Community Care Clinic, and we're able to integrate a physical activity prescription. So they go to the doctor, she says, hey, I see how much activity you're doing, writes them a new prescription, hands that to them, and then we track over time, are there health outcomes or health benefits as a result of just those exercise prescriptions? Um, and within a one-year time frame, we saw 829 patients who received prescriptions. 40% um, were not doing any physical activity, and 90% of those folks were not meeting the national guidelines, which is 150 minutes per week. 40% uh, uh, of those patients lowered their cholesterol levels, 45% improved their physical activity levels, 40% lost weight, a cumulative over 200 pounds for these patients who are so in need and do not have health insurance. Um, and 36% of them lowered their blood pressure. Uh, and our physician, Dr. Amy Wilson, would tell you it's a direct connection to the prescriptions that they were being given for exercise. Um, we also have seen uh, a huge improvement in childhood obesity. In terms of the patients that we've seen, we partnered with Salisbury Parks and Recreation, uh, Salisbury Pediatrics, and um, the JF Hurley YMCA for a program where the pediatrician actually sends the patient to us for a twice-weekly 
program for them and their families uh, for children who are in the 95th percentile for height and weight. And so we partnered with the Duke Center for Childhood Obesity Research, and they found a statistically significant and clinically significant improvement in obesity and childhood well-being um, and uh, liking fruits and vegetables uh, for these children. Uh, we've seen over 53 patients, um, and Duke found us to be so successful. Originally, we were unfunded, uh, but then funded us uh, and granted $10,000 to continue this program. Um, so those are three smaller wins, but we know there are a lot of things that have happened as a result of the partnerships. Um, one that we haven't had a chance to really share is the idea of uh, providing additional support for women who are experiencing postpartum depression. That's something that's not currently being discussed. Um, we don't have a lot of services, but through conversations at Healthy Rowan, we were able to connect the dots between two agencies, and now patients are being able to be seen and are getting care um, for that condition. No, sir. All right. Thank you very much for coming yeah, thank today you so much. and providing this with us. And I hope that you're very successful. One more thing. Talk to us about how the health assessment came out and what the top three uh, areas that our county needs to uh, focus on. Absolutely. So the county health assessment or the Community Health and Human Service Needs Assessment, that happens every three years uh, because of the ACA ruling with our nonprofit hospital. So we have partnered with them. So instead of the hospital doing an assessment, the health department and thereby county doing an assessment, Cardinal, United Way, we all decided to work together on this one. Um, and what happened, that came out in 2018, um, and the top three results were healthy lifestyle behaviors, so including those things like exercise, um, healthy nutrition, uh, tobacco-free spaces, um, all came to the top about what we needed to work on. Mental health um, was another one. We need to provide additional support for resiliency and trauma-focused work, and then addressing substance use. Um, so really being one of those prime conditions um, or top three priorities for the county. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. Thank you. This, at this point in time, Mr. Bringle is going to come forward and give us some information about the uh, a budgeted item that we already have, which is the uh, addition to or new offices at uh, Dan Nicholas Park. I'd like to also call Pete Bogle and Elizabeth Trick of the uh, Bogle Firm Architectural Group. Um, as all of you know, a little over a year ago, I came before you, I think in the planning session, talking about our concession stand and where we were at. You know, it's approaching now 53 years of age. We've outgrown that probably 20 years ago. And with that, uh, you graciously have uh, funded uh, our project from the standpoint of being able to employ an architect. Through that process, we have uh, the Bogle firm. Over the last six months, uh, uh, Pete and his staff, along with our staff at the park, have worked together to try and create not only a location, but a design that we felt would be, um, you know, benefiting to us. And actually, uh, they'll probably touch base on a little bit. Our concession stand actually got a little bit smaller than what we currently have. But through design concept, rather than allowing uh, the visitors to come into concession, you know, that creates a lot of opportunity for security uh, and just other, other issues. So the people are outside. And normally, if you think about it, wherever you go, to most concession stands, you purchase from the outside, not inside. So th that will be a change for us. Uh, as you well know, with wildlife uh, population, as far as employees growing, they are in need of office space and have been for a good while. So with the concession stand, we've uh, generated uh, four offices and a small conference room area to where we can meet and do what business that we need to do with as the, of the park. But anyway, uh, our Parks Board met last Tuesday and they unanimously approved the project and design for what uh, Mr. Bogle and Elizabeth will present to you. 
At that point, uh, if you approve the design concept for where we're at, then we're prepared to go ahead and advertise uh, this week uh, for um, bids for the plans. And then our bids will go out uh, February 13th. Uh, well, we'll have a pre-bid February 13th. Uh, actual advertising will go out this week. And then March 3rd, the, the bids will be due in, and then the Board of Commissioners meet on March 16th, and we would hope to be able to have, uh, to present to you uh, a bid package along with a selection of contractor. Any questions of me before I turn it over to Pete? All right, thank you. I believe Don stole both, most of my thunder there, so um, I'm going to show you a quick we've got some some images that uh, were submitted in really what we've got in this building it's this is this is a three for one deal um, we've got a uh, concession stand building uh, the office area um, concession stands in the kind of the green area over here on the left office areas in the orange and then in the middle is the public restrooms uh, combining all this together you can see on the site plan down below here um, directly off of the existing parking lot that's there. We'll be doing a little bit of work on the parking lot to bring it up uh, where we need it in the front. Uh, and then views out to the, to the lake for there, from there. Um, this is a building that's uh, replacing, a, like Don said, a 53-year-old building. Uh, also, the one piece that he didn't mention was we're taking some of the office need or the office people out of the uh, wildlife center so that they can expand back into those spaces uh, for their needs. Um, I'm going to show you real quickly also just the, uh, where are we? There he is. I'll just put him in motion here. This is off the lake in the front there. You see coming up toward the building. This would be facing the lake. Just kind of rotate around the building here. This is the office end uh, that we're going around here. Main entry to the office is here on the right. Uh, we don't really have any main entry to the concessions on, on the parking lot side, just delivery area and the main concession side and entry into the bathrooms would then be on the lake side. Uh, also providing a little bit of patio area right outside the concessions um, so people can uh, be there enjoying the view of the lake and using their or having their concessions there. Uh, the other, the only other piece in this that I didn't mention was also the requirement that we had to, to locate a 24-hour ATM uh, in this building as well. So there you go. So if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer. Yeah, Pete, I'd, I'd like to know what exterior treatments you're using on this building. This is uh, looking at hardy, hardy board, uh, painted hardy board, and then brick. Which area is the brick? I see that the reason I'm asking, it looks like the hardy board's on the bottom. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We, we had looked at some brick as an option for this, the lower pieces of the piers here, but no, we are back to hardy at that point. So we're all hardy. Okay, and the materials up above the hardy plank is what? It's hardy uh, panel. So it's just, just cement a raised panel, panel. Yes. it's not steel. I, I should use the, the actual term instead of the, the brand name. It's, okay. Yes, so I, I cement just trim board. <clears throat> I'm just looking for the long-term maintenance on it. Yeah, and, we uh, were too. Is, is brick that much more on this particular building? It would be, yeah. Um, the other piece that we're uh, trying to match is some style that's out there. A lot of the other buildings have this, um, okay. this look. The closest building to here is the... Uh, so the Barber Junction, uh, the train depot that was moved in, okay. it has a very similar look. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you assume most of the people will be coming across the bridge or the walkways down through here on the lake side? Is that why you? Yes. Yes, we do. Have the, the, out there so they can view the lake and stuff after they order their ice cream. Correct. Is there is a parking area up above. Um, but yeah, most of the people are going to be coming from, I don't know if you can see my little bitty um, uh, mouse pointer there, but coming around near where the paddle boats are down to the bottom left, uh, there's a bridge that goes across that end of the lake. 
and that comes directly up to the concession stand and then the other bridge that goes around the other side of the lake. I'll kind of triangulate right there to the concession stand area. We have to have commercial bathrooms on this. Absolutely, yeah. Let me just mention uh, one thing. Um, when we bid it out, uh, he's put it as standing seam, metal roof, and we know that that is a higher cost, but we've got a bid alternate as just asphalt shingles, which probably when we look at where the bid cost is, it would be a deduct from that standpoint if we go that route. The other is the construction of this is not steel frame, but wooded two by fours. Yeah. Again, trying to keep our cost points down. Uh, very much knowing where our budget was and what we're working with, we've tried to be as conservative as we can, not asking for a lot. And along that same line, our staff, the park maintenance, we will be running the sewer line from the septic tank over to the old concession, as well as we will also be running the water line from an outsource to that area from that perspective. So we're going to try and uh, utilize some of our staff with some of the cost. We will not set the septic tanks. That'll be part of the bid process, but we will tie to the septic tanks going over to the old concession. And any other wiring that we may have to do for IT or uh, the electrical, Duke will do that, but for a pathway for IT, we may have to provide that as well. In the long run, how long do you expect this metal roof to last? Metal roofs last almost indefinitely. It's just what they end up looking like and whatever penetrations um, end up um, happening to them over time, maintenance pieces like that. Metal roof is going to give you a good long, long, uh, the warranty periods, 20 to 30. Um, asphalt shingle, you can get about a similar warranty period. Yeah, but realistically, aren't they 12 to 15 years? No. You, you being in the insurance business, you, you, you've seen that. I, okay, I, we can discuss that later mm -hmm. when we get the bids back. <laughs> uh, Pete, uh, mm -hmm. I'm in the process of building a house with a metal roof, and they're telling me 50 years as far as structural. Yep. Now, we all know they're going to fade as they get older, and it may be some maintenance, but uh, I'm always been of the – opinion let's build it the best we can so we don't have to maintain it forever mm -hmm. and uh, that's why I ask about the brick option uh, is it possible to get that option priced uh, we can see um, some of this is not a straight switch but let's look <laughs> and you're you're talking about doing brick on all faces well, I'd want it to look consistent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something we can explore. Commissioner, would you be looking at maybe like the split face yeah. concrete yeah. rather than no, the red two inch type Yeah, not, not something that's a finished brick, but you know, something that uh, would be economic, like split face. Which you can get in multiple colors as well. <sighs> Um, to do that I'd as the... Good. I'd be good with gray. But then you're going away from the wood. That <laughs> yeah, you, that's, so that's I, a I very different like look to, and a different type of... And, and I get that, believe yeah. me. And I appreciate what you're trying to do to provide some continuity out there. I'm just looking at it from a long-term investment type situation, what, which is the most economical long-term. Right. For what we would have to do to meet the energy code and change all the plumbing and everything else that's run inside of these walls, if we're going to go to a split face block you would actually be cheaper to just put some brick veneer onto the wood studs that are there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I don't, I don't mind looking at I, what I a brick like veneer. Because if it's, if it's an appreciable difference and I can justify to myself, we don't want to do this. Okay. But if we don't know the number, then we never knew sure. what it might've been. So sure. I, if that's not too much trouble. Yeah. I, I don't think it would be um, not to, not to switch to a brick veneer. Brick veneer. Be yeah. Fine. Yeah. We can look at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? We would need a motion to approve the design so that we can move forward. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you. you.
-hmm. Thank you very much for bringing this to us. Don, uh, how many, how, what square footage is this building? Uh, 3522. 3522. Yeah. <laughs> Budget amendment. Uh, I guess we just seek a information about these budget amendments or just go ahead and approve them. We gotta make a motion to approve budget amendments. Second. Excuse me. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Board appointments. One second. All right, Amy Lynn is here. If you folks have gone over these uh, agriculture advisory board appointments, uh, we have had an issue that this board was um, not active for several years, and then that's that's true. And I guess I can say that. I don't get anybody in trouble. When Amy Lynn got here, uh, she reactivated this board. And uh, the problem is that everybody came on at one time. And now we've got everybody that's going off at one time. And so this did not come to her attention until recently. And um, so now... If you notice, uh, what we're trying to do is to stagger the terms of the board and avoid losing uh, the majority of the members at the same time. And um, if you will look what we're doing, Kim Starnes is the current chairman, and um, we want to extend his term for two years beginning February the 1st, 2020. Randy Elam, one year beginning May the 1st, 2020. Mark Malden, who's been very active in several boards around for us, was to extend his term two years, beginning January the 1st. And uh, Mark Hamill uh, will reapply for a second term, a three-year term, beginning June the 1st, 2020. And Mark Shepard, uh, Michael Shepard, excuse me, currently is appointed for three years. Um, on January the 6th, 2020, and keep as is replacing, he is replacing uh, Daryl Nichols, who has served on the board for a while. Uh, Amy Lynn, is there anything else that you'd like to add to this? We appreciate you coming and enduring this whole thing. Uh, I have any questions about this? I only have one. If you check with these people, make sure they still want to be on the board. Look at. I think they almost all of them have submitted their applications. Okay. <laughs> all right. well, we, we didn't see any applications. That's the reason I asked. Oh, oh, I, I know. Uh, are they in there in here? It's in the list. Okay. 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 I make a motion to uh, <clears throat> readjust. The board's terms and years as expressed by Amy Lynn Alberson. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, in Liberty Volunteer Fire Department for Fire Commissioner Alan King has applied for reappointment for a term that will expire, uh, yeah, expire June the 30th, 2021. 
2021? Uh, is there a reason why we're doing that now? Oh, okay. Okay, I make a motion to accept Alan King. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, Local Emergency Planning Committee, Steve Strout from the town of China Grove applied to fill the vacant elected off officials seat. There are no term, terms, term dates for this committee. Nominate Steve Stroud. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Nursing Home Advisory Committee, Robbie Dale Pickler applied to fill a vacant seat. If appointed, the term would expire July 31st, 2022. Make a motion to accept Robbie Dale Pickrell. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Um, uh, we have John Leatherman has applied for reappointment for a three-year term that would expire December 31st, 2022. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Ma'am? Um, how many terms and how many years has Mr. Leatherman been on the planning board? Um, I do not have that information in front of me. So he's he's eligible. Okay, I had thought he had he had uh, served earlier. Yeah. Yeah. What he did. Okay, um, I just want to make a comment about the planning board. Uh, I really believe that we need more diversity on this board. Um, both gender and race, and I'm just hopeful that we as commissioners can be out there looking for folks and inviting them to apply. Um, you know, we always talk about, well, we got this many openings, but most people, if they haven't been involved, are not going to just go online and fill out an application. So. I would just urge my fellow commissioners to be looking for folks and um, hopefully we can get a little more diversity on our boards. Um, I have gone to, uh, what is, Amy, what was that program you went through with Rowan County? The oh, leadership, leadership Rowan, thank you. Uh, and ask them to uh, make that a requirement of the folks going through their program, and they can't do that. They can't make a requirement. Uh, but those are types of people that have gotten good ideas about what goes on in Rowan County, and we'd love for them to volunteer. I have asked several of them to, come to uh, put in applications, and we actually got one the other year, and he lived out of the county, and we couldn't use him. Uh, but... Anyway, I, I agree that uh, we need to get more people involved in this. Getting back to the planning board. Nominate John Leatherman. We second. have a nomination and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Michael Harrell applied for a two-year term that would expire December the 31st, 2001 on the planning board also. Uh, uh, nominate Michael Harrell. Second. Have uh, anybody, uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, please note there are approximately 54 vacancies on various county boards. So thank you, folks, for attending. Um, and I will now accept motion the to motion adjourn. to adjourn. Sir. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you.